Barnabas Armstrong was nearly back to his farm when his sled was attacked by wolves. As he furiously lashed his steeds to escape, his loyal dog jumped off the wagon to fight off the wolves. Once safely home, Barnabas got his gun, summoned his neighbors with pitchforks, and went out into the dark, cold, wintry woods to find his dog. You're listening to Backyard History, the hidden stories that happened in your own backyard, the podcast version of the weekly history column running in newspapers across the Maritimes, with your host and author, Andrew McLean. Barnabas must have been baffled. Not only was this late 1830s event the first ever wolf attack in New Brunswick, it was also one of the first times wolves were even seen in the hundreds and hundreds of years that Europeans had been there. It was the beginning of a perplexing decade of wolf attacks and wolf hunts. The very existence of wolves in New Brunswick is a mystery. The earliest mention of a wolf only appears to date back to 1764, which was a century and a half after Europeans began to colonize the Maritimes, when a list of furs being exported from St. John included two quote-unquote skins of Nova Scotia wolf. Being as there's no such thing as a Nova Scotia wolf, the reference is kind of confusing. It appears that throughout France's colonization efforts, despite all of the time the French spent hunting and trapping deep in the woods, there was not one single mention of wolves. Even later, the loyalists that moved into New Brunswick after the American Revolution, who were not the least bit shy about complaining about any perceived persecution by either human or animal, never once mentioned any livestock damages by wolves. Yet, in 1792, the legislature of New Brunswick declared a bounty would be paid for any wolf that was killed, declaring, Many losses have been suffered by sundry inhabitants of this province by the destruction of their sheep by wolves. The bounty offered was 20 shillings per wolf killed, if it was killed by a white person, but only 10 shillings per wolf if it was killed by an indigenous person. In order to collect the reward money, the pelt, or skin, of the wolf that was killed had to be brought into the government. However, no record appears to exist of a single wolf bounty actually being paid. Later, in 1818, prominent Nova Scotian geologist, scientist, and the inventor of kerosene, Abraham Gesner, declared that wolves were extinct in New Brunswick. Two decades after Gesner's declaration, Barnabas Armstrong and his dog made that fateful trip to the local grist mill with a wagon of grain. Barnabas must have already had a great deal on his mind as he drove his horse and sled through the snow, as only the day before his wife had given birth to twins. Barnabas was a poor farmer, and two new mouths to feed would be expensive. At the mill, Barnabas traded some of his grain with another farmer for some fresh, raw meat. It was nightfall before Barnabas and his dog began to make their trip home. Likely attracted by the meat, all of a sudden a pack of wolves appeared out of the darkness surrounding Barnabas' wagon. Barnabas tore a pole loose from his sled and tried to beat at the wolves as they nipped at his terrified horses as they galloped in terror towards his farm. His dog, a mid-sized mutt, stood on the wagon, snapping at the attackers. Barnabas grabbed some of the raw meat and threw it off the wagon. The wolves hungrily fell upon it, giving him and his wagon a chance to escape. But as they were escaping, his loyal dog jumped off the wagon, racing back to hold off the wolves. Barnabas' encounter kicked off an alarming few years in which wolf attacks were shockingly common in New Brunswick. In the early 1840s, there were several back-to-back, especially brutal winters. To make matters worse, the economy was slumping, with the shipbuilding industry in rapid decline, with the wooden ships being replaced by new metal steamboats. This meant that the demand for lumber was dropping, 
and in some cases companies were unable to pay workers. Political unrest deepened, and there were multiple riots all the way from the North Shore down to St. John. The government at the time was widely seen as draconian, and jailed journalists who criticized it. Now, on top of all that, there was a series of wolf attacks being reported all over the province. Poor New Brunswick could not catch a break in the 1840s. In 1844, world traveler Sir James Alexander wrote that he was near Washadomic, also known as New Canaan River, when wolves attacked his camp. He later wrote that he'd heard that a surveyor he'd befriended was killed by wolves near Grand Falls a few months later. That winter, newspaper reports in the St. John Globe tell of wolf attacks in Sussex and Musquatch. The following winter, more attacks were reported by La Pro River and again by Eel River Lake. Abraham Gesner, the same man who declared wolves extinct in New Brunswick more than two decades earlier, scoffed at these early reports, such as Barnabas Armstrong being attacked by wolves. Even his mind was changed, however, in the winter of 1841, when he just happened to be visiting Eel River Lake in Carlton County, when he heard wolves howling at night. Days later, he saw with his own eyes a pack of wolves crossing the lake. Facing a wave of attacks by wolves and mass public hysteria over the wolf menace, the legislature revived the old wolf bounty. This time, however, they upped the bounty significantly, offering the staggering sum of three pounds per wolf pelt, which was a vast sum of money at the time. Just like that, the hunter became the hunted. Driven by a spiraling economy, the hunt for wolves became a welcome source of income. Men and women alike took to the forest to hunt for wolves. Yes, women. The bounty hunters' names contain a certain number of women's names who hunted not just for wolves, but for bears. For example, in 1828, Margaret Allen from Hampstead in Queens County collected a bounty for killing a bear. Bears also had a bounty on them, which was offered for far longer and was collected far more frequently than wolves ever were. In old letters, we can see fears of bear attacks in New Brunswick, which were far more persuasive than they were there the whole time since the beginning, since the French times, when wolves were always missing. Over the next few years, throughout the harsh, insecure, and impoverished 1840s and 1850s, a staggering number of wolf pelts were turned in to the government to collect the lucrative bounty. The total number of wolf pelts numbered some 90 in 1848 alone, and over the decade in which wolf hunting was popular, the number ran into hundreds upon hundreds of wolves. Abraham Gisner, who had declared the wolf extinct in 1818, was puzzled. The sheer number of wolf pelts the government was paying bounties for simply did not make sense for a province of New Brunswick's size. There was simply not enough space or food for such an enormous number of wolves to have lived in New Brunswick. As far as Gisner could account for, based on eyewitness accounts he'd collected, there was as few as one lone pack totaling 15 wolves. He suggested this pack came into New Brunswick from Maine, searching for deer. Desperately starving in the unusually brutal winters that characterized the first half of the decade, the wolf pack resorted to the extremely unusual behavior of attacking humans. Gisner recorded that that pack he had seen was actually destroyed in 1846 by the people of La Pro River, who managed to corner and kill all 15 wolves using quote-unquote an ingenious device, which he never described. And that was done in retaliation for the wolves attacking their town. If New Brunswick could not possibly be home to hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of wolves that were killed, and the Maritime's top scientists could only account for 15 wolves, well, 
what had really happened? Legendary historian and naturalist William Francis Ganon delved into the wolf mystery much later in 1908 and was also puzzled. By then, there had not been a single wolf sighting in New Brunswick since 1862, when three pelts had been turned into the government for a bounty. Ganong thoroughly reviewed old documents dating back hundreds of years, concluding that there was little to no evidence of wolves actually having ever lived in New Brunswick before the 1840s. Ganong, who was nothing if not obsessively thorough, Next, personally contacted dozens of elderly trappers. He found that literally not a single one of these old men who'd spent their entire lives in the woods had ever once seen a single paw print, let alone a real wolf. The mysterious New Brunswick wolf menace in the 1840s simply made no sense. In Gadong's notes, we can find a clue to what may have actually happened. He recorded meeting a Mr. Manly Hardy of Maine who purchased wolf pelts the New Brunswick government had bought as bounties. Hardy told Ganong that some of the wolf pelts were from a breed of wolves only found in Labrador. Perhaps the most likely explanation is that during the economically depressed 1840s, crafty New Brunswickers acquired wolf pelts from elsewhere. They then turned these pelts in to the New Brunswick government to collect the exorbitant reward money. As for the first man to record a wolf attack in New Brunswick, Barnabas Armstrong, he, with his neighbors, ventured into the cold dark woods, armed with a single gun and pitchforks looking for the wolves that took his dog. They never did find the wolves, but they did find his beloved dog limping up to him along the snowy path. Hurt, but still alive, and who recovered fully. That was Backyard History with your host, Andrew McLean. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for another hidden story that happened in your own backyard.